Running a Christian race is a lot like running a marathon. It takes perseverance, focus, and discipline to cross the finish line. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12:1 to run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Just like a marathon, the Christian race can be long and difficult. There will be times when we feel tired and want to give up. But we must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. He is our strength and our champion. Running this Christian race means staying committed to God's plan for our lives. It means trusting in Him even when we don't understand what's happening around us. We must remain faithful to the end, no matter the circumstances. We must also keep ourselves spiritually fit by reading the Bible, praying, and being a part of a community of believers. Just like a marathon runner trains their body, we must train our hearts and minds to stay focused on God. And just like a marathon, the Christian race has a finish line. And let us always remember that we are not running alone, for God is with us every step of the way. Great to see you here in the house of the Lord. Wonderful worship. And as we focus in God's word, you can turn to Acts chapter 20. We're going to be looking at the life of Paul again today. But do you remember when you were a kid, your parents would say to you, probably with a look of shock or bewilderment on their face, for heaven's sake, what are you doing? Have they ever said that to you? Well, today I want to flip it. I want to ask you, based on the life of Paul, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? I think that's a good question. Probably a better question. Because you matter, and heaven matters, and many don't know that they matter. There's lots of people who are lost in our world, who are trying to find purpose and meaning, and they're struggling through life the best they can, and yes, they might have some successes on, under them. They might even be religious, but they're missing something, and they don't know Jesus in such a personal way that instead of living for themselves, they can live for Jesus. Well, Paul wrote more than one-third of the New Testament, and when you read his epistles, you know that Paul is talking from experience, not from an ivory tower. He's not disconnected from what really matters. When you read the book of Acts, you hear the story, you read it, all that he had gone through just to get the word out because of God's grace in his life, and it wasn't an easy journey for him. And actually reading about his experiences, the setting, the situation, the circumstances, everything about him. And so that's good background when you're reading his epistles that he has written that we enjoy. We're going to be looking at a number of scriptures that he said. One of the things that stand out about the life of Paul in his writings is the analogy of the race. Finishing the race. Our main verse today in the book of Acts is Acts 20 verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now, I've shared this with you before, but in case you're new, here's something you need to know about me. I hate running. <laughs> oh, man. I'd rather do anything else than run to get from point A to point B. I'd rather walk, bike, drive, skate, crawl, even speed walk, which I don't really like either. But I'd rather do that than running. Now, I probably offended a bunch of you because you're runners. But for me, okay, I'm just talking personally. I don't like to run. For me, there has to be a reason why. Why are you running hard to get from point A to nowhere? That's the way I think. Running for run's sake doesn't do it for me. There has to be a finish line. There has to be a goal. There has to be a reason. Now, don't get me wrong. I love to compete. I like being first. If it's board games or other games, and I hope I'm a good loser when I lose to someone who's better than me, and you could look at it as a learning curve, but, you know, I think there should be a bit of competition in each and every one of us that strives for Pushing past our limits and going for more. Pushing past our conveniences or the way that things are done and push for more. And Paul is talking about that in his Christian life. Going for the more. Not settling for second best. That there was 
a crossing line to finish, that there was a point in the race. And I was just talking out loud. There is a difference between exercising and actually running a race. You have to do the stretches before you run. You just don't jump in in cold turkey with your legs spinning so fast that you dig a hole before you go forward. There's a lot of prep stuff that happens that you should do so you can run that race safely without pulling a muscle so you can go the distance. But to run in a race, you have to exercise. And that's why Paul in our main verse is saying, I consider my life. There's a difference between being a spectator and a participant. When I was in grade eight, for some reason, the coach of the track team put little Brian Warner in the 3,500 meter race at the big high school that my sister went to. You know what? I hate running. Did I tell you that? <laughs> and so there was another teammate. He was like six foot two or whatever, and he was super fast. And I'm thinking, what is the point? Why am I in this race? I think they had to throw someone into the mix to have two people from our school, so I was the second person. Well, I made it around one lap, and my buddy, Sean, I think his name was, lapped me. I'm thinking, what is going on? So you know what I did? I became a spectator. I saw my buddies on the side of the hill watching me run and watching everyone else run. I thought, I'm not going to finish this race. I'm tired. I don't want to do this. And so I actually went on the sidelines, sat down amongst a quiet peer group, thinking, what are you doing? And then I cheered Sean on, and he came first. I didn't finish the race. That was a, a long, terrible day for me. That wasn't even my notes. I don't know why I shared that. I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't give up. Go the distance. Have the confidence that there's a point in the race and it's a matter of crossing the line, not being first. Now there is a difference between being a spectator and a participant. I learned that the hard way. If you look at the Olympics or sporting events or whatever, watching a race and being in the race, that's, that's different than being the spectator. You don't get as tired when you're a spectator. You can eat your chips, hot dog pop. You can relax in the couch. You can put your feet up. You can text. You can watch. You don't hurt yourself. You don't pull a muscle or whatever. You don't even get disqualified. Isn't that good? But there is a difference. The spectator, he looks at the podium. The one who participates is on the podium. One is cheering, the other is straining on. One sees the difference in the game, the other makes the difference. One has no buy-in, and the other has given up everything. The athlete, time, sacrifice, pleasures, they've given all that up. They strain, they work hard, they want to go the distance. One can walk away from it and lose nothing. The other can lose everything. So the question is today... Which are you? Are you a spectator or are you a participant in the race that God is calling you to run? Are you going through the motions? Are you half committed? Are you taking the easy route? Or are you saying, you know what, I'm going to take a look at my life and I want to go the distance. I want to cross that line in how I run matters. See, Paul was in the race for the long haul. No matter what it cost him, where it took him, how long it would take him to accomplish his goal, I think he was the greatest athlete of his time. If you look at the contrast, as Pastor Steve preached a couple weeks ago, a great message, who Paul used to be, Saul, and the difference that happened in his life. And then he writes all these epistles and goes through all these hardships and yet is running, persevering, not giving up, counting everything as loss so he may gain Christ. What a great athlete running the race. And we could all be like him. Why? Because it's Jesus that we follow. It's not a person. And Jesus is the author and perfecter and finisher of our faith of our race. He is there for us. So I want to consider some statements that Paul made on his way to Jerusalem. He knew where he was going and the purpose of the race. We read that in the book of Acts. So just going to share some scriptures. You could listen. Acts 20 verse 22, he says, And now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. In the race of life, we may not know what happens tomorrow or the next day, but we do know who holds our tomorrow. We do know that if we're following Jesus Christ, he'll make sure that we finish that race. 
It's him that put us in that race. We just have to decide to keep running. Acts 21 verse 13, then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. That's conviction. That's commitment. That is, he had his head in the game. He knew what it was all about. Acts 22, verse 22, the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. Doesn't that just smack you? Paul is not fit to live. Let's get rid of him. Let's wipe him out. Let's kill him. And a number of times they tried to do that. Acts 23, verse 1, Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. That just exemplifies a day-to-day grind, but a commitment that his conscience was clear before God, that he was running that race in a certain way that God would be pleased, no matter man's opinion or judgments on him. Acts 23, verse 2. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. And then coming back to our main verse today. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. Actually, let me stop. Let's read it together, if you can read it and see it on the screen. Ready? However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. I want to look at that verse, break it down word for word. The first word is however. The howevers in life are life-changing. They're directional. They're pivotal. They're something new. It's different. The however's in life are those moments that things become more clear as a Christian. We live in a world that is so upside down. The however's are those moments that we realize that and we've made that choice to stay in the game, to stay in the race. The psalmist had some critical moments in his life when he looked at the successes of the wicked. In Psalm 73, verse 16, he said, I almost slipped until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny, meaning the wicked. He almost slipped, but he had one of those until moments, or if I can say it, the however moment, where all of a sudden, what was chasing the wind, all of a sudden, you stood still, even in the center of the storm, and realized, oh, it's not about me. It's about God and following his plan for my life. It's a however moment. See, because of all that happened to Paul, he didn't give up, he didn't give in, give out. He kept on going. However, was an important word and concept to him. If you had one of those however moments when it all clicked, when you got your reference back, your head was clear, you came to an understanding of your calling, who you were in Christ, and you were more determined than ever before to live for Jesus. Maybe today is going to be one of those however moments, those watershed moments, those, that moment of decisiveness where there's going to be a difference. I remember in high school, one of the however moments was when I had to make a stand for my beliefs and my lifestyle choices. And those can be tough years as teenagers or even as young adults. Lost some friends along the way. But it was a however moment that was good for me and God. And sometimes, if you think about it, the unsaved need to see in your life the however moments. They need to see what you stand for, why you're in the race, the difference that that makes knowing Jesus, and not only what you believe, but how you live. So it's okay if today is one of those crisis moments, a a however moment, that you're going to be different. God, by His Spirit, I believe, is speaking to each and every one of us. The next word or group of words is I consider. How many times have you taken a good hard look at your life and figured it all out? You know what your purpose is. What you're supposed to be doing. You have a goal. How many have a 10 year plan or a 20 year plan? A detailed strategy and it's all laid out day by day. 
How many are still wondering what you're going to do for lunch or supper? <laughs> you know, life can be a challenge. And even though you might make all the plans, and they're good plans, and maybe even godly plans, Paul even had the plans change. God changed them on Paul, going one direction, but then all of a sudden his missionary journey would switch, and he would say, I'm going to have to pick this up at another time. God is calling me this way. I think our lives should be written in pencil so that God can erase them and change them if he wants. Because the problem is if we put it in permanent marker and we say, God, this is what I want my life to look like. And with permanent marker, we give him the wish list. Everything that's important to us and what we want to do. And so God can just bless that. Aren't we missing the point of the race? See, Paul says the whole point in all this at the very end of that, that verse was the grace of God. The grace of God is giving us what we don't deserve. We testify to that. If we had a list in all the things that we wanted him to do, where is God's grace? See, we think we deserve his blessing. But Paul went through some deep, difficult, dark times. And yet he understood the grace of God. We can learn so much for his writings. Sometimes we're too busy to consider. We just keep doing what we've always done and think we're okay. But God might have a different idea. We don't consider our lives. We just take it day by day and it goes by so fast, doesn't it? We're just glad to put our head down on the pillow at night. There's no time to consider. We're too busy. We need to rest. And then tomorrow there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we have to do. But Paul is slowing down. There's the however. And then there's the I consider. Paul considered his life, his new life, from the old to the new. new and in his mind there's no comparison. So today, I'm going to take a breather right now. You, stop and think for a moment. What do you need to consider about your life? What is your life about, really? So Paul says, however I consider, and then my life. He's making it personal, and when we read it, we should as well. Only you can live your life. Others might tell you how to live it. They might have a lot of suggestions or opinions or expectations. But it's your life to live. And Paul knew because of God's grace, the gospel of grace, that his life was changed. He was not the same person who watched Stephen be stoned to death and gave his blessing. Or who sought out Christians to drag them to prison. That was before Christ. Now his life was about a right relationship with God through Jesus. Not a religion of do's and don'ts that still left one in their sins, but a relationship that was, I want to. I'm considering my life. I'm making it personal. I'm following Jesus Christ. His life was not his own. It was to be lived out for Jesus. And then he says, it's worth nothing to me. That's quite the statement. It's a leap. It's a holding on as you make that statement because you're leaving the past behind. And Paul had a lot to leave behind, but he was holding on to Jesus when he was saying that. My life is worth nothing to me. But he was worth a lot to others. Think of the lives that he touched when his life wasn't worth anything to him because he was holding on to Jesus. Think of the impact that he had in the church wherever he went as he was reunited with the apostles or united for the first time because of Barnabas and how he became such an influence on them and started his missionary journeys. He touched lives wherever he went. Why? Because his life was worth nothing to him. He knew that Jesus was everything to him. We told our kids when they were younger that they were worth more to us than a million bucks. We want to instill how precious they were to us. And that was way back when 10 bucks was a lot of money. So maybe I should say it's millions and billions of dollars worth. How do you put a value on a person? We said our love for you is bigger than a whale because they knew that whales were huge. Our love for them was like that. You know how much God loves you? So much. I mean, it's, it's unfathomable how deep the love of Christ. To get that into our system, into our mind, into our spirit, and let it trickle out how we live, that's what Paul is talking about because he considers his life worth nothing because he found his life in Christ, which was everything. 
So he's not saying he has low self-esteem or a poor self-image, but he considers who he is in Christ, and that is life itself. And so he wants to live in a way that pleases and honors him. Paul's purpose in life was to share Christ with others. The good news is still the good news. Amen? It's a gospel of grace. And in the race, that's what it's about. It's about God's grace. He writes in Philippians 3, verse 7 to 13, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider, there's that word again, myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead. No wonder Paul was the greatest missionary who ever lived. How missionary-minded are you? To be missionary-minded like Paul is to understand the race of grace, testifying to the grace of God. And the great commandment is for every believer throughout time to go and preach the good news, that gospel of grace. What is worth more to you than the gospel? I know it can be difficult to share your faith. There's times that I haven't when I should have. I'm thankful for the times that I have. We can learn from Paul here. We can consider. We can understand how important it is. Then he says, if only. So he's throwing some, some really interesting ideas in there. Consider, however, if only. If only. He considers his life worth nothing in comparison to what Christ can do for him instead of what he can do for himself. If only I may finish. He's willing to give up the past for the future. He's driven to make life count on God's terms, to stay in the race, God's race wanting to finish. So he says, if only I may finish to get the job done. Not my job, but what God is calling me to do. That's what he's saying. For organizing chores, for getting things done, I like what someone said. This is how I organize chores into categories. Things I won't do now. Things I won't do later. And things I'll never do. <laughs> I, I like that. That's a, a really good to-do list. There are many things we start but we don't finish. Like a piano I'm restoring. I've had it for a long time now. It couldn't keep pitch so I gutted the inside. And it's a beautiful antique piano. So I took out the soundboard. I have plans to make it into a desk. I have had plans to make it into a beautiful desk. And I still have plans to make it into a beautiful desk. Are you with me? That's a goal, but it's not really happening right now. I've started it. It's just a bookshelf. I need to finish it. I don't know. I'm just struggling with that. Or if I read a book. I've actually am reading several books. I want to impress you with that. The only problem is I start reading them and I pick up another one. I start reading that. I'm having a hard time finishing the books that I started. Anyone else like that? I don't know. And, and Paul is saying, you know what? It's good to be focused. And if you're going to finish anything, make sure that you finish the race that God has called you. Because that's what is most important. Paul again looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good consciousness, conscience, to this day. I hope that you can say that as well. I'm not talking about being perfect, but when we fall, we get up again. We don't get, go off to the sidelines like I did in that race being grade eight. You learn your lessons, you get back in the race, you keep going, because it's the gospel of grace, remember. It's not the gospel of you have to do this. It's the gospel of being the person that God wants you to be and allowing him to do his work 
in you. I don't know if you do to-do lists. I don't really like to do to-do lists unless I'm giving them to someone else. Then they're a good thing. But if you make a to-do list, there is a point in it, isn't there? So I think what Paul is doing, he doesn't have a to-do list. It's a be-do list. And the to-do list is checking things off. It's just doing stuff. But what Paul is saying, it's, it's a be-do list. Because I am a Christian. Because I am in the race. This is how my life is going to look. Because I'm testifying to the grace of God. If what we do as Christians comes out of being in Christ, that makes all the difference. Instead of just saying, check, 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 and then we do what we want. See, the task was assigned to him by God. Everything else would be a do-do list. But the be-do list that Paul is talking about, that's the way to run the race. And then he says, the race and complete the task the Lord has given to me. See, only God knows when you are done because it is he who gave you the task. It's not based on your feelings or thinking, well, that's good enough. But he wants you to follow him, to keep your eyes fixed on him as you're running, to go the distance, to not lose sight of why you're in the race in the first place, not to look around, but to hear his voice, to see his face, to, to be able to grasp his hands, to know that there's that crossing line. In the New Testament, there's six times that our Christian life is likened to a race. Paul in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. See, there's a cost involved, isn't there? It's weighed out. Paul says, I'm not ready not, I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die. He counted the cost, he took up his cross, and he was following Jesus. He was ready, he says. There's a cost, I'm ready also to die. And then there's that finish line. If only I may finish the race. That was important to Paul. I hope it's important to you as well. I want you, I don't want you to get so discouraged in life. And Satan is the accuser of the brothers when you mess up, when you sin, when you fail, when you fall. That when you're in that position, that you think, I'm not good enough to be in that race. I can't get into the groove again. I can't join the others because I'll feel like I'm a hypocrite. I'll feel like a loser, and they know it. But wouldn't it be great, all in the race together, all looking to Jesus Christ, that there's no comparisons, there's just encouragement. When someone falls, you help them up and say, we can do this together. That when someone is going off to the sidelines, that we're mindful enough to see how difficult their life is and what their struggles are and they need a friend, that we can extend God's grace to that person because the race is about grace. And we could testify to that. We could live it out. We could help someone. Just like Barnabas who encouraged Paul, we can encourage someone else. So he says, if only I may finish the race. Spiritual growth, John Ortberg, Ortberg says, doesn't mean a life of doing what I should do instead of what I want to do. It means coming to want to do what I should do. Want to do what I should do to complete the task, Paul is saying. Keep going. God has a task for you. There's a reason to live. Understand his purposes for you. Don't give up. Aspire to do the will of God. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else, Paul is saying. He understood his calling. How about you? Where are you at in the faith journey today in the race that God has called you? What is the point? Paul says, and he ends with this, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. See, the good news is a gospel of grace, giving us what we do not deserve, those second, third, fourth, fifth chances, however we may need. God's grace is that good news. Make it personal today. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't give over. Instead, 
Focus on him and let him make the difference in your race. Well, I just want to conclude with a couple uh, questions for you here as we take a look at Paul's life and how we are to respond and wrap it up and how we are to be encouraged in our own faith to live for him and make it, it count. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearance, each and every one of us. What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Are you living for Jesus every day on your list, the be, do list? And really, there's nothing more important than finishing the race. Don't give up. Don't give out. Don't give in. Just keep going. And in your race that you run, testify to God's grace. Everyone needs to hear the good news of God's grace. It's how they start running their race. See, the world doesn't need to know how good you are. They need to know how good God is in your life so they can understand what grace is all about. And if there are good things happening in your life, thank God. Give the reason why he has blessed you. And when you are struggling in your most difficult times, Thank him for his grace and his mercy in your life. If that's part of your race, people will see in you Christ, the hope of glory. The reason that you're still in the race, and again, they'll understand that God cares for each and every one of us. How you run matters. Maybe today you're considering, you're having the whoever moment, you're saying if only, you're pushing forward. You want to be what Christ wants you to be and to do what he wants you to do. Would you bow your heads with me? Just want to ask a simple question. Is there anyone here and you realize, I'm not even in the race? Pastor Brian, I I didn't know what you're talking about at the beginning. I'm just here in church and I've gone to church before, but, but now I understand there's a relationship thing that's a little different than religion And it's knowing Jesus in that personal way. If he can start something in my life, I want to get in the race and follow him the rest of my days, however long they may be. For that to happen, it's admitting that you're a sinner and believing that Jesus died for sins, your sins, all of your sins, and confessing your need for Jesus Christ and then making that decision. See, Paul's life was about decisions, the however, the if only, in considering And if that's you today, you're deciding to make Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, to have that start in life that matters and it's for all eternity, would you just put up your hand and say, Pastor Brian, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I need to be saved. I want to get in the race that is forever. If that's you, just put up your hand. I just want to see that, acknowledge it, and you can put it down. Perhaps there's a Christian here today and It hasn't been easy. You've struggled. You've fallen. Maybe you've sat on the sidelines and you're just cooling off a bit and you're wondering, how do I get back in? Should I get back into the race? Is it worth it? And God is speaking to you and he's saying, yes, it is. Take that step of faith. Be the person I know you can be because I created you and I love you and I have a plan for your life. And then do what I want you to do, Jesus is saying. If that's you and you just need the help of the Holy Spirit to make that difference in your life, will you just put up your hand and want to remember you in prayer? Yes? 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 Father, as you look down past the physical, you see the arms that are raised, the hands, but you also look at the heart and what's going through the mind. I just pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to each person, that they would know without a shadow of a doubt that they're loved by you that they would be encouraged in their faith as Christians by your Holy Spirit, that you will help them to run that race. And that you would give them that, that conviction and that determination, that commitment to stay in the race no matter how hard it is because their eyes are on you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of their faith. And you will help them, you will be with them, and your Holy Spirit would give them counsel and wisdom and guidance and strength that they need. Help us to, like Paul, make a difference in other people's lives so that they would understand the goodness of God, his unconditional love, 
The grace that is freely given, that changes lives and gives hope, not just in this life, but forevermore. So I pray for each person today that each and every one of us would be encouraged and empowered to live for you on a day-to-day basis. Not in our own strength for all of our own reasons or the ways we want to live, but for you. Help us to consider. Help us to have that if-only idea. Help us to push through whatever roadblocks might be in our way or distractions. Help us to stay focused on you so we could finish that cross that finish line and we ask all these things in Jesus name and everyone said amen God bless you have a great day a great uh, last couple days of July and then into August don't forget the freezies cool off a bit after a hot sermon and just enjoy the rest of the day get to know each other at the coffee center as well And thank you for visiting. If you're a guest this morning, write it down on the registry. There's also newsletters at the Welcome Center. All right, God bless you.